You've seen those bumper stickers, haven't you? The ones that have the letter I followed by a picture of a heart, followed by a statement of what it is that the person who is driving that car happens to love. You know, it's interesting to pull on the street and see what it is that someone is declaring their love of. I heart New York. I heart golden retrievers. You've, you've seen those, right? Well, once I saw, honest, I'm being honest here, I saw the most unusual version of one of those bumper stickers. I was, I was in a parking lot of a coffee shop walking back to my car when I saw a bumper sticker, or a bumper of a car, bearing a sticker that read, I heart the 1928 revised edition of the Book of Common Prayer. So let me give a little bit of, of explanation here so that we're all on the same page. It's, it's, uh, the Book of Common Prayer is used in Anglican and Episcopalian faith. Um, and so you walk into any Episcopalian church in the world and you can open the Book of Common Prayer and you'll be able to follow along with the various prayers and readings and spoken responses in the service. They'll be, they'll be the same across uh, the whole tradition. The most recent revision of the Book of Common Prayer came in 1979 which replaced the version from 50 years earlier, the 1928 version. And so there were some changes in the 1979 version, and with this this background information, the bumper sticker begins to make more sense. The owner of that car is unhappy with the changes that got made in 1979 and still has a bumper sticker voicing his objection or her objection to the, the new version, which isn't all that new. It's nearly 40 years old. It's kind of like, you know, after an election, the person who keeps the the bumper sticker for the losing candidate up driving around. If you look at the history of Christianity or the history of religion, for that matter, the one constant has been changed. New expressions of faith in the form of creeds and teachings were produced at the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople and the Council of Trent. The Reformation gave us new insights by Martin Luther and John Calvin and so many others. The last half century has given us new forms, the Second Vatican Council and the 1979 revision to the Book of Common Prayer and the invention of the praise band. If change has been the one constant, the other constant has been resistance to change. You still find Catholics who continue to decry Vatican II as a bad mistake nearly half a century later, or witness the bumper sticker pining for the 1928 version of the Book of Common Prayer instead of the new one, the new one that came out when Jimmy Carter was president. But before we laugh, before we laugh at people who seem stuck in the past, we would do well to remember that the same impulse also resides in us. As Unitarian Universalists, we're not immune to this resistance either. A few years ago, I traveled to Louisville, Kentucky to preach the anniversary sermon for a UU church that was celebrating its 50th anniversary. Um, And following the service, I was approached in the receiving line by a founding member of that congregation, a lifelong Unitarian. She came up to me and she said, I'll tell you where Unitarianism took a wrong turn. (laughs) It's when we merged with those damn Universalists. What a mistake that was. It was was 1961. I I wasn't exactly sure what to say to that. I I tried to be pastoral. Well, well, these things do take some getting used to. That one constant is change. Consider even the the worship service, some parts of it that many of us regard as indispensable. We've had our gray hymnal for only 20 years, which means beloved hymns like Spirit of Life are recent innovations. And new favorite hymns like Blue Boat Home are younger than many of the children in our elementary school program. Our UU7 principles, which some revere as the definition of what Unitarian Universalist stands for, they aren't even 30 years old. The ritual of lighting the chalice, that started in the 1950s. 
the parts of our church that we think of as the most quintessentially UU, they'll change sooner, later, but they will. Change is the great constant. If you joyfully sang Spirit of Life on your first Sunday attending a UU church, you may not be aware that two decades ago when people first tried to sing it, they thought, wow, that's novel and strange. It's going to take some getting used to. Or try putting yourself in the shoes of those Unitarians who came to a worship service in the 1950s only to find that their religion had a new symbol, the chalice. What's this thing that we're doing? And you can imagine, can't you, that way back in 1928, some Episcopalian had attached a placard of protest to his Ford Model A automobile that read, I love the 1896 edition of the Book of Common Prayer. <laughs> Not this newfangled 1928 one. It is an important spiritual practice to be able to distinguish and differentiate between what is transient and what is permanent, between what is transitory and what is meant to last. The ability to discern is important because a great deal of harm can be done by taking things that are meant to change and treating them as if they must not change. That's the definition of idolatry, giving something more importance than it actually has worshiping what is, in fact, not worthy of worship, mistakenly loving what isn't worthy of that degree of love instead of what is. So allow me to pick on the guy with the bumper sticker on his car in that coffee shop parking lot one more time. I sometimes dream that he'll, like, hear this sermon out there and he'll say, oh, that's me. But So I heart the 1928 revised edition of the Book of Common Prayer, which is kind of what Jesus said we should do, right? I'm being facetious there. Command, what's the commandment to, to love God and the neighbor as ourself, to love the widow and the orphan, the hungry and the sick, the prisoner and the strange, the prisoner and the stranger? The Jesus he loves uttered no commandment about loving a formula for baptism or the syntax of a prayer or a specific edition of liturgy. Right? Alas, this guy's easy to pick on. It's much, much harder for us to realize what transient things we ourselves cling to at the expense of being loyal to what is permanent and worthy of our highest devotion Buddhism teaches us that suffering is caused by desire, which is a form of attachment. Insisting, that, insist, insisting things that are transient not change is that attachment in its very definition. And so it is a question, being able to discern, is this thing, this thing that I really enjoy, is that meant to be a transient thing, or is that an eternal thing? And to treat each in its proper way. It's a lesson that isn't only true for religion. It's true for life as well. Several years ago, the NPR program, This American Life, had a program dealing with the subject of transience, dealing with the subject of having difficulty with things that change. And in one of the segments, we visit a woman in Houston who is a compulsive scrapbooker. Her daughter, her only child, is four. And the woman has already created 17 scrapbooks documenting every single day of the child's life. The scrapbooks are artistic feats. It can take tens, ten hours to create a single page. And she can't keep up. The child is growing faster than her ability to scrapbook. Though her daughter is only four, she's already fallen so far behind that it would take her over a thousand hours of doing nothing but scrapbooking to catch up. I went back and uh, searched online and dug up this episode and listened to it again. And I should point out that the people at the radio program took this story in a direction that didn't make fun of her scrapbooking. 
Their story humanized her. We learn that this woman's childhood included a series of losses, the death of a grandmother, moving away from her childhood home. Transience that made her resistant to letting go. Her husband offers this explanation for her obsession. He says, it's her way to hold on to things. It's to create something that she can physically look at to recapture that feeling. As human beings, we live lives in which most everything we encounter is transient and impermanent to one degree or another. Like the scrapbooking woman in Houston, our days are full of fleeting, transient moments, more than can possibly be captured on archive-quality paper. Change is the great constant. One of my favorite poets, Jane Hirschfield, uh, revisited her poetry. She has a, a, her newest uh, poetry collection coming out this week. Um, I'm going to be first in line to buy it at the store. Probably the only one in line to buy it at the store. <laughs> But here's a a poem from her last collection. It's called The Promise, and it talks about this nature of the transience of things. Stay, I said to the cut flowers. They bowed their heads lower. Stay, I said to the spider who fled. Stay, leaf. It reddened, embarrassed for me and itself. Stay, I said to my body. It sat as a dog does, obedient for a moment. Soon started to tremble. Stay to the earth of riverine valley meadows, of fossil escarpments, of limestone and sandstone. It looked back with a changing expression in silence. Stay, I said to my loves. Each answered, always. There is a transience in our lives. The aging of our children who grow faster than our ability to photograph them. the additions and subtractions, the moving into homes and the leaving homes, the cycle of the seasons. The permanent, the permanent is that love and courage and faith with which we face a changing world. Love what is transient, but love it by letting go of it. And know that in that change there is unfolding and beauty. Amen.